This is Eastman's Elevated Podcast. I have on great guests that are really knowledgeable, consistently successful. We're able to dive deep down the rabbit holes of these different subject matters of shooting, of physical fitness, of mental toughness and drive. All the different skills that make up a complete hunter that you can become. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So on this week's show, I have back on my friend Kip Fowler. Um, so man, uh, Kip is a awesome human being and um, awesome bow hunter. I love getting him on the podcast. Love catching up with him. And um, it's been too long since I've had him on. He's been going on these um, giant adventures, uh, chasing sheep around and um, grizzly bears and uh, just some uh, some some wild. Uh, hunting action and so yeah just wanted to get him on and talk through um, the adventures talk through a lot of his training and prep Uh, we talked through like having the right gear on a hunt um, the mindset and man he's just he's just like a a a savage in the mountains he just goes for he's all in so uh, made for a a great conversation I really enjoyed it thanks to Kip uh, for taking the time and being on we'll get right into the podcast I just want to thank a couple sponsors Uh, So I want to thank Savage Arms. Uh, Savage builds the best out-of-the-box accurate rifles on the planet, man. I'm so impressed by these rifles, and they have so many different models that will fit your budget or fit your preference. Uh, Us at the office really like those 110 Ultralights. It's a lightweight mountain rifle, uh, super accurate. It's got uh, an adjust to stock and an adjust to trigger on it, so you can adjust the stock as far as length of pole, as far as... Uh, comb height you can adjust the trigger pull to lighten it up to make for a more accurate rifle and you can do all that without a blacksmith Um, they build um, just really accurate forgiving rifles they seem to get along with all different ammo types I'm just really impressed bunch of different calibers so you can find your favorite caliber to go hunt with and uh, we really appreciate their support over there at Savage Uh, so yeah if you're in the market for a new rifle make sure to uh, go check those guys out I also want to thank Silencer Central. So Silencer Central builds silencers. And, um, man, silencers have such a big advantage. Like, I was able to use these at the Sig Sauer art competition. And um, I just get more and more familiar with these silencers. But it's just so nice not to blow out my eardrums or not to, uh, like... The, the percussion that comes off, like, with shooting a, a muzzle brake or something like that. And it just... Um, hurts everybody's ears around you where a silencer is going to silence that rifle uh so it's not going to be so loud and i feel like it gives you an advantage while hunting as those animals don't know where the shot came from so you may get a follow-up shot i also think it reduces recoil which makes for a more accurate rifle um you know these things uh, they don't have a, a lifespan to them. They last forever. And the ones at Silencer Central are built with titanium, so super lightweight. They have a backcountry model, the Banish Backcountry. You can check that one out, super light. Uh, and then they'll help you take care of the paperwork. Uh, you can even send your rifle and they'll thread it so the silencer goes right on. Uh, just an amazing company, an amazing product over there at Silencer Central. And I also want to thank Camo Fire. So Camo Fire is an app where they have 80 new hunting deals that come up every 24 hours. You watch the app, you can save a pile of money on great overstock gear or great gear uh, that comes available. So check those guys out over at Camo Fire. With that, over at Eastman's, uh, we got some new Beyond the Grids hitting. Uh, Dan's Elk um, movie is on there. Uh, Elk Film is on there. Uh, He also has one with his brother which is a two-part series where they're hunting um, Shiris Moose with Guy. Uh, I think that next episode should be out now uh, with Guy and his Shiris Moose. I have some good mule deer ones coming up, so check that out at Eastman's Hunting TV uh, on YouTube, Beyond the Grid. And um, check out the magazines, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Eastman's Hunting Journal. We have the Mule Deer Collective, Elk Collective. Right now you can save 50% by putting in the promo code SAVE50. And... Um, yeah, the magazines and everything else we do. So we really appreciate the support. Um, check that out. And, uh, man, let's get into this podcast. It's a great one with Kip Fowler. I'm your host, Brian Barney. Eastman's Elevated. Here we go. How you doing, Brian? You there? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. How about you? 
Oh man, I'm doing good. It's been uh, way too long since you and I have caught up. Man, a hundred percent, right? It's crazy. Yeah, it's been busy and a, a whirlwind. But I was hoping by the time you and I connected, you'd have a bear down. <laughs> well, I was hoping so too. Yeah, it's um, it's been a heck of a season. I've been having a bunch of fun chasing those things around. I know you love to bear hunt as well. Yeah, we went down uh, just for a quick trip to Arizona. I didn't get the time this spring that uh, I was hoping for. Uh, eventually, I'll have to get up in your neck of the woods and try it with a bow. But we've just been, yeah, we've been pounding Arizona the last few years. It's been great. But I thought, yeah, I thought by now you would have put an arrow in something. <laughs> well, yeah, um, me too. You should have got a pretty good track record with those things. Um, yeah, it's just... Uh, you know, it, it just reminds me how difficult it is. So I've had four or five sends and one send yep. I gave the buddy the play yep. on it, but I've had some big goes at him. It just hasn't quite come together. And the majority of the time I get there and he isn't there just because it's so far, it doesn't hold to the feature or moves yep. off, which is just part of the game. And then, you know, the other day the bear still was there up the ridge and I spooked him and it's just like, oh man, I... I just lost focus for like just a few minutes when he wasn't in the spot where I left him, you know, but just the way yep. it goes, just bow hunting. Uh, well, that's fun. How long does your season go? How late do you have? June 15th. Oh, okay. Well, I, I still got my money on you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you well, time. I'll keep hunting hard and it's a heck of a season and I've passed some bears as well. So it's like, if yeah. I, you know, if it doesn't come together, it's not that big a deal. It's fine. Uh, like you, like you've killed some great bears there out of Arizona. Like you're really looking for jumbos down there. And I, I'm kind of the same way. Yeah, I've gotten picky and it's, you know how it is when you kill a medium bear or even a smaller bear, it's almost like, uh, cause I, you know, you just, once you've got a few on the ground, it comes down to really trying to find the, the really big mature boars. There's something about them, you know, but when you, when you, kill something smaller than that it's a little and honestly it's a little disappointing and uh so yeah we're trying to be really picky down there and they're tough to judge aren't they it's like uh, oh my gosh it, it seems yeah, like I, the I, mediums are tough to judge they are the big ones you know the minute you see them but we always talk about when you're trying to talk yourself into a bear don't just don't you'll know the big ones when you see them and if you try to talk yourself into it you'll be disappointed if it's all about wanting to harvest a mature boar. But yeah, every time we try to talk ourselves into something, we come away realizing we shouldn't have. So yeah. Uh, that really resonates with me, Kip, because that is the rule. If you have to talk yourself into it, you're usually, yep. you know, you're not real stoked <laughs> when you shoot it or it's uh, usually smaller than you think it is. It's usually smaller. Yeah. It's sometimes the color, you know, you, you love the color, but yeah, in terms of size, if we're if you're really trying to convince yourself to try to harvest it, then then you're trying too hard. But yeah, well yeah, good luck with your spring hunts. I'm I'm actively following your updates, so oh. hopefully it uh, you get a chance to fling an arrow. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've been having a ton of fun. I like how long this season is. I like uh, that you have to grind, that you have to continue to put in days. They're really big goes after these bears. So there's actually been a couple days where I've made my legs pretty sore, which is really good for me. You know, I train really hard, but it it's tough to get that, you know, eight, nine, ten hour endurance workouts, you know. And so bears definitely give it to me like on some of these big scents. So it's all in good fun for sure. Well, keep keep after it. Like I said, my money's on you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, and, and you've had, um, man, it's like uh, recently you got to go chase like brown bears. How fun was that to go after oh, the alpha gosh. species? You know, so I, have and by the way, I'm assuming we're just jumping right in, right? Yeah, so, yeah, I figured okay, as long yeah. as you're good with that. No, I'm good. Yeah, so um, that was kind of the first real like guided it's i think that was the first guided hunt i've ever been on brian and i've always wanted to go after brown bear and so if you're going to go after brown bear you have to have a guide um and if that one fell in my lap a friend of mine had booked a hunt to go after a kodiak bear and we had talked and his fell through at the last minute and he just caught me in person and said hey do you want to pick this one up um and sometimes the best opportunities come that way. They just fall on your lap and you have to jump on them while you have an opportunity. So I went after this Kodiak bear. This was three. In fact, I booked it to go in 2020 during COVID and it got nuked right at the last minute. Like when COVID was first coming out that spring, 
I was on the phone with the guide and the outfitter. And, and this is before we knew what was going on with COVID. So we all kind of just thought it was a, a, a slight scare and it wouldn't be a big deal. And as the hunt got closer, it was supposed to be in April, you know, the beginning of April, uh, the outfitter called me literally like two weeks before and he said, everything is getting shut down. So we're going to have to hopefully reschedule for next year. And it worked out. Um, so I ended up having to wait a year. And it's amazing when you look back, the, you know, the years of our lives go by so fast. But when you're anticipating a hunt like that, it was the slowest year of my life, I think, <laughs> waiting for this Kodiak hunt to roll around. But it's a species I've always wanted to have a chance to go hunt. So I ended up going in 2021, my first guided hunt I think I've ever done. And it was just incredible. But I think most of it was I, I, I was going to go with my bow. I was going to kill it with my bow or try to hunt with my bow. And then I realized, you know what? I, I don't feel the need to do it. I didn't feel the need to try to harvest this bear with my bow. And I kind of took some pressure off. So I, when I decided to put the bow away, even before the hunt went, started, and I just decided to take my rifle up, it allowed me to just relax and enjoy it a little bit more and not have to worry so much about getting in a perfect, you know, archery scenario. And so I just took my gun. And I took a good friend of mine up there with me, my good friend, Trent Thornton, who I have, he's the one that introduced me to bear hunting. So I started bear hunting with Trent down in uh, Arizona 20 years ago. And he's the one that got me hooked on bear hunting. So when I had this chance to go up and hunt a Kodiak, I took my friend Trent with me and we just enjoyed it, Brian. We just loved everything about being there, but it was a grind. It was a tough hunt. We hunted the first six days and we didn't see much. It was that first hunt of the year or the first season and the bears just were not moving a lot. So for the first six days, we literally just glassed and glassed. And I think we were seeing one bear a day and nothing really close. And so it was on, I think, day seven where we decided to finally get out and walk and hike a little bit that we happened to see this bear that I ended up harvesting. Um, but it was it was an incredible experience and an incredible way to to go after a bear like that. Um, something that I'll never forget. And I hope to, I, to get a chance to do it again someday. Good for you. It's in that kind of lit a fire to doing these huge adventures. It seems like you've done a bunch of them now since that brown bear. But yeah, what an amazing experience. I, I can see where like taking the rifle up there takes some pressure off you where it's not so much pressure to get it right. And it doesn't sound like you would have had a lot of opportunities like that's pretty like you need a you need opportunities with a bow and arrow or it's just not going to come together you know and it sounds like you yeah. guys were grinding and then finally found a bear by hiking around a bit and glassing which you know you think those master vantage points would turn it up but it probably gave you like some different angles on country looking in some different spots and then caught that brown bear and was able to make it happen dude that's just incredible and it sounds like you had a really good attitude too it's like you commit to something like that and it's probably a a little stressful when you write the check but you kind of pay for it over time too and you makes you work harder to make that little bit of money and then you go on it and then you just soak in the experience like you did man that's just amazing all right that was kind of the the mentality we had so i had i've been hunting with trent for 20 years bears and these these hunts we do for spring bear down in arizona they are a grind. I mean, we've hunted down there 10 days at a time and not seen a bear. So it is all glassing and it's, it becomes more of a psychological hunt than a physical hunt because you have to have this mentality that you may not see much. You may not see many animals, um, but you have to have the mentality of this long-term perspective that you only need to find one. And so taking my friend Trent with me, I knew what his uh, attitude would be about it. And so like I said, for six days, I was up there with my my guide was Cole Kramer. Uh, the assistant guide was his nephew, Will Wilkes. And we just sat under this glassing tarp for six days. And it was brutal. And um, But we stayed drier under glassing tarp. But it is more of a psychological grind that, you know, it's okay if you don't see a bear on it during the course of two or three days. And so we just weren't feeling the pressure because we had been there, done that before. Um, so when we eventually... You know, it was Cole's choice. My guide, Cole, said, look, for the first half of the hunt, we're just going to sit in glass. We don't want to spread our scent around. We're just going to glass and let things happen. And then, you know, midway through the hunt, if things haven't happened, then we'll get out and look a little bit. But he was so concerned about keeping our scent controlled because these big boars, if they're cruising through an area looking for sows and they cross your scent path, you know, you may never have a chance to even see them or see them again. So he was very cautious that way, and we knew that. And it was just ironic, though, the day we decided to go finally hike, 
uh, we hadn't even gone a mile. We'd probably gone a half mile or maybe a thousand yards from our glassing point. And my buddy Trent ends up spotting this bear uh, laying up out of a river bottom. And it was, the funny thing is, it was in a perfect spot for a bow. <laughs> it would have been a perfect setup to go after him with a bow. And so I was kind of laughing, like, well, that's kind of ironic that that would happen. But this bear was laying there and we set up on him at about 110 yards. So it was right there. And then we spent another hour just trying to size him up. Um, he was laying down, and Cole got him to get up and move a little bit, but Cole was being really picky, making sure we knew what we were looking at. I'm, I'm looking at my buddy Trent, because the bear looks huge to us. I mean, we're used to hunting these, you know, black bears in the Southwest that are, you know, that are not that big. And then we're looking at this Kodiak, and it's clearly a boar. And, you know, it didn't take much to convince me that it's what I wanted to shoot, but Cole was being really picky. But it was a perfect archery setup. Like, you, you couldn't have scripted a better archery setup, I don't think. But in the end, we harvested that bear. And I just didn't feel any pressure, Brian. And because of that, I was able to, I think, enjoy it a little bit more. Those hunts are expensive. You know, those types of hunts that you're referring to that I'm sure we'll talk about, they're expensive. And so when guys like you and I, that um, those hunts are hard to commit to financially, it's hard to come home empty-handed. And I was weighing all of that going into the hunt. Am I willing to spend you know, 25, 30 grand on a Kodiak hunt and come home with nothing. And that could have happened with a bow. And I just didn't want to stress about that. That's a huge financial commitment. So I put the bow down, took the rifle up, took that off the table so I could enjoy it a little bit more. And in the end, I think that was the right call for me. So that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what a great team member to team up with Cole, uh, especially to introduce you to guided hunts. It had to yeah. feel just like a really knowledgeable buddy that was in camp. And I, I, uh, yeah, just uh, I think so highly of that guy too, man. His his knowledge is, is just um, you know he's been hunting those bears for so long and hunting knowledge and and um, uh, man, it had to be really fun to team up with a guy like that. Yeah, Cole was great, and I again I I, I kind of fell into that hunt, but it was one I'd wanted to do for a long time. But you realize in those scenarios, trust the guide, and you hear that. Um, but that was my first experience hunting a, with a guide, and it was. I, it was a psychological shift for me because usually I'm calling the shots and I'm usually uh, making a game plan in my own mind. But then you get up into foreign territory with a species you've never hunted and you have to rely on your guide. And so, you know, uh, but knowing who Cole was, knowing Cole's reputation, it was it, it was just it was a very good learning experience for me to realize this isn't my natural turf and I'm here to learn. And I learned so much from Cole. And uh, it's something that I've applied in other hunting scenarios, some of the things that I learned from Cole. But, yeah, when you're in, on those types of hunts, you trust the guide. And, and then – and so it was everything I hoped it would be. And it, the nice – the cherry on top was that that bear ended up being a little bit bigger than we thought it was. He went over 10 feet. He almost booked. Um, he was just a beautiful, big, mature boar. But at the time when we were looking at him and Cole was picking him apart, Cole wasn't sure. At first it was, yeah, he's definitely over 9 feet. And then he got to nine and a half and Cole was very comfortable saying he would go nine and a half. And I, I just wanted a mature boar. I just wanted to be able to harvest a mature boar. And then by the time we, you know, end the hunt and come back out and take him to the biologist, he's over 10 feet and he almost booked. And it was just, it was a cherry on top that uh, I'll, I'll take any day of the week when you have a surprise like that, but just an awesome hunt. But yeah, you're right, Brian, that kind of lit a fire under me to try to hunt these different species. I've always just, all growing up have hunted mule deer and it's these general season over-the-counter tags hunting mule deer uh doing kind of the backcountry hunts that we've all done and then that was my first experience kind of branching out into a a species that i always wanted to go out for but i realized i could do it i realized financially time commitment preparation if you have something to shoot for you can do it and i've applied that uh to different species now you know I've gotten the sheep bug, so I've been able to hunt doll sheep and stone sheep um, and some of these other types of hunts. But the same fundamentals apply that if you if if your listeners have a species they want to go after, there are means necessary today to do it. Where when I was a kid growing up, they just didn't have the resources that we have now to try to identify some of these hunts, to try to um, network with some guys that we know. And and that's what I would encourage guys to do is find a species you would absolutely want to go hunt. And once they start to do your homework a little bit and network a little bit, some of these pieces just fall into play and you can start checking off some of these bucket list hunts that, uh, you know, we've all, we all have that bucket list. And I think most guys 
sometimes it's a little intimidating to know where to start, but there is such a wealth of resources now available to help guys like me and you and others to put some of these into play. Man, it's amazing. So um, doll sheep and stone sheep, like what are some of the resources or the research you do? You just start networking with, with guys you know to to get some names of some outfitters to talk to, yep. uh, a lot of internet research, like trying to figure out like the, the animals that are produced, the areas, or like what's some of the, the research that you do when you're looking at one of these big hunts? You know, so much of it is relying on guys you know, and that would be my first recommendation is in every industry, and the hunting industry is not uh, exclusive to this, and it's not um, secluded from it either. There's bad information, there's misinformation, um, so to go, uh, to rely on guys, you know, and so when I like this Kodiak hunt that I went on, for example, that was a guy that I knew that came to me that we had talked about hunting and he said, Hey, this, I have this hunt lined up with Cole, but it's going to fall through for me. And I didn't know who Cole was cause I wasn't into Kodiak bear hunting. I, so once I started looking into Cole and it was coming from a buddy of mine, uh, whose opinion I really value you, I realized what a great opportunity it was. I look back now, it was a tremendous opportunity, but when I did my, um, for example, my first doll sheep hunt, I was doing a lot of research, watching YouTube videos, looking at chat forums, looking at different Instagram and YouTube and Facebook accounts, hunting, and I ended up reaching out to a guy who does a lot of uh, uh, videos, YouTube videos, and he responded to me, and I asked him if he had any hunts available, and he didn't, but he said, look, Kip, there's a guy that uh, runs an outfit right next to me and he's really good and I recommend you reach out to him because he might have an opening and so I did I reached but again it was one of these situations Brian I I had something hot I had a hot potato right there so I reached out to that outfitter and that outfitter said you know I do have a hunt available this fall it literally this was like in May and he said I have a doll sheep hunt available you know this August uh, I have an opening. Do you want it? And then I had to decide, do I pull the trigger or not? Um, I did a little bit more research. I made some phone calls to some clients that had hunted with him, but it was coming from a known source that has a good name in hunting, a strong reputation that recommended him. And so I had to act on it right away. So this was the outfitter is Riley Pitts. Um, he has an outfit, big game backcountry guides. He's up out of dead horse, Alaska, but I went with Riley that first year and I had an incredible experience. Um, and Riley, some of these outfitters, they don't do a ton of advertising. A lot of what they do is word of mouth. They go to the sheep shows. They go to these shows, but a lot of it is client referral. And I'd received a referral from a neighboring outfitter, neighboring guide. So I went with Riley. I went up there the first year. I killed a, an awesome doll sheep. My guide, Forrest Gangle, he uh, lives in Sitka, Alaska, but he guides during the summer and fall with Riley and Forrest and I had an incredible, it was the hardest thing I have ever done physically, Brian. It was the hardest. We killed a caribou the first day, an awesome caribou. Uh, and that that's another story in and of itself. But we went in to hunt doll sheep, but the hunt hadn't started yet. So we went after caribou. I killed an awesome caribou about four miles from camp. And that turns into a, you know, a, a back and forth, back and forth hauling hunting. And then the sheep hunt starts and we backpack clear up into this area for the sheep hunt. And ended up killing a sheep and it, it died in a hole and we couldn't get out and had to climb this just crazy stuff that happens on these hunts. But it was the most physically demanding scenario I have ever been in hunting. And I've done a lot of these backcountry hunts and I had this incredible experience with Forrest, um, who's a friend of mine to this day. And then I've gone back. I went back the next year and hunted an Arctic Grizz with Riley and his crew and killed an awesome Arctic Grizz with Riley. And my guide was Caleb Stillians, who has a lot of um, presence in social media. Caleb was awesome. And then I went back the next year and hunted again for Arctic Grizz because that's another species that I could go on and on about. It's, there are these incredible animals up there that are these inland grizzlies and they're just ferocious and, and mean, but there are these incredible animals. And it's, it opened my, my eyes up to some of these North American species that are just unbelievable animals in the terrain they live in. But so much of it has been the networking side which is kind of back to your question, the networking side of how do, how do you go about looking into these hunts? But I, you know, and I, I do a little bit of um, posting on Instagram. That's kind of all I really do. And I'm not out trying to promote anything, but I've had quite a few guys reach out to me and say, hey, I, I see you've done a caribou hunt. 
who did you go with? Would you recommend them? Hey, I see you did a doll sheep hunt. Hey, I see you did a stone sheep hunt. And that's what I would recommend guys do. If you see somebody, social media or otherwise, but you can relate to them and you think their style is kind of your style, reach out to them and ask them what their experience was. And I think you're more likely to get more, you know, unbiased, realistic uh, viewpoints and get, to give you credible expectations on what your hunt could consist of. That's where I find at least I've had very good luck that way. And so I, that's what I would recommend guys do. It's really smart, Kip. Um, you know, it's, I don't think I've leaned on that resource enough over the years. And so much of the stuff we do in the States, we get, you know, a bunch of experience. We know the country, we know the animals, we know e-scouting and tags. And so we kind of get this way we go about things. But when you're going to a totally different place like that, um, yeah. to be able to network with people. And so I did, a. It's really inspired me too. I love the Instagram. Like your photos of the sheep hunting is so incredible, and I've I've got a million questions I want to ask about it. But just that back to that networking side of things is like I went up and did an Alaskan Yukon moose hunt. Um, it's been quite a while. It was like two thousand and. 16 and I you know I kind of just did all the research myself I had a couple buddies I went with a uh, little bit of networking here and there found a good spot and I had a great hunt I wasn't successful but now I, I'm starting like you've inspired me to like start to pull the trigger on some of these bigger hunts and after hunting Shiras moose like I'm really hooked to try to kill a big Alaskan Yukon moose and the the price doesn't get any cheaper and that goes for <laughs> do-it-yourself or guided you know it's like yep. a it's a big ticket item you know and it's you know it's it's kind of like well do I want to go for a budget hunt or do I want to go to the best place that gives me the best chance to be able to arrow one of these moose but just being able to lean a little bit more uh, on on different contacts that I have and even guys that I've never met but may be friends with yep. on social media. And, gosh, I called um, uh, one of my buddies, um, um, uh, Stevie, up the other day, or just a friend from social media that I'd never talked to personally. He's a friend of a friend. And just starting to make these phone calls and talking to him, and he's been hunting moose his whole life. And some, I learned more in that conversation than I learned 10 or 12 days hunting moose up yeah. there the last time. And just his tips on calling and his protocol and how he goes about it and how they kill him with a bow. They always call him in. They're really tough to stalk with that type of terrain and, and also hunting real similar country that I've hunted before. But I learned so much leaning on him that I, I really have to – uh, lean on that a bit more because people are willing to to help and share information and and you can really learn a ton especially from those guys that are doing it all the time and just like you said it's such like trusted information when an outfitter gives you the name of his outfitter next to him and says yeah this guy runs a good operation that holds so much more weight than just looking up a name on the internet or talking to his previous clients and making those phone calls like you did like it gives you such a feel for their experience and how it went and gives you confidence on going on a hunt like that because, you know, it is a, a big commitment, you know, and you want to have a quality experience and you know that success isn't guaranteed. That's part of hunting, but you just want the opportunity at it and you want a quality experience. And it sounds yeah. like that's what you got. And I, I just can't imagine like that. That sheep hunting, I can see why you've gotten the bug, especially <laughs> because you're such a high country muley guy like me and that, you know, extreme terrain hunting that stuff is kind of what trips her trigger. And then being able to go there in, in some of the wildest places in North America and then the most extreme places in North America with weather and, and just the country, you said it's the most physical hunt you've ever been yeah. on. Like, I can't imagine what you embarked on for an adventure backpacking into that doll sheep country, man. It had to be oh, it just was, it was amazing. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. So I and it's fun because it, it's interesting because I've grown up going on these hunts with a buddy or with my dad or my brother or my cousins. And then all of a sudden you're thrown into this, you know, environment you've never been in with a guy you've never hunted with. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm going out with my guide Forrest Gangle and I don't know Forrest. But you're. Uh, but I actually reached out to the outfitter prior to this doll sheep hunt. This was two years ago, and said, "Who do you, have you kind of decided who you're going to match me with as far as my guide?" And uh, if he and, and in this scenario, my outfitter Riley Pitts, you know, he was trying to garner information from me prior to the hunt. They know what a sheep hunt's going to be like, so they're trying to figure out 
what KIPP's all about. So they have you fill out a, it's kind of funny to have you fill out a questionnaire on, you know, you have to sign the waiver to, uh, you know, to take liability off of them. So that that's kind of a surreal moment for some guys that have never done these types of hunts is you sign the death waiver. Like <laughs> if I, if I am dismembered, injured or killed, they're not liable. So I remember the first time I was signing that, that was on that Cody off bear hand that kind of hit home to me like, wow, this is interesting. But going up there to hunt doll sheep, I filled that waiver out with, uh, with Riley's crew and they ask you to rate yourself, you know, one to 10, 10 being the best shape possible and one being not so much in shape. And you're sitting there like, where do I rate myself? Because I don't want to short change myself, but I don't want to be the <laughs> jerk that gives myself a 10 and I show up and I'm a six and they're laughing at me. And so I, you fill that out. But, um, what I did is I sent, I, I got on the phone with Riley, obviously before I booked the hunt, but then after I got on the phone with Riley, I said, look, this is, this is who I am. And I would love to be matched up with whoever you think is the best fit for me. And so he matched me with Forrest. Um, and then I met Forrest and then you realize there, there's thought that goes into how the outfitter likes to match you with his guides. If, you know, sometimes you'll have older clients that aren't as physically able and he'll match them with a guide that can accommodate that and they can hunt that way. And he put me with, uh, you know, most of Riley's guides can go anywhere, do anything. And I got put with Forrest and Forrest and I, you know, we killed the caribou the, you know, the first day out. And by the time we got the caribou back to camp, you know, that was a two day adventure and we're dead. And then we load up the next day and we got 60 pounds of gear. Actually, I think it was 68 with my gun. And we, we go clear up this Canyon and get up in a place called, the, uh, that they called the football field. And then we're looking for a water source and Forrest knew there had been a water source there in the past and we find the water source. So we're able to filter water. Um, but, but it's so interesting to be in those scenarios with somebody you've never met, but how quickly you can bond at Forrest and I, like I said, we ended up, uh, two days later harvesting this Ram that, uh, ended up down in this Canyon and we thought we could go out the bottom of the Canyon and we couldn't. So we had to climb up and you know, my pack was probably 110 pounds and Forrest was probably 125 and you're looking, you're already four or five days in and we had to go straight up and, it was so physically demanding, but I will say I felt like um, because so much preparation had gone into that hunt, I felt like I could do it. Um, and that is so much a part of these types of hunts is to to know how to prepare. And so that's another kind of back to the topic of reaching out. Um, I encourage guys, number one, if you have questions about these hunts, doll sheep, stone sheep, Kodiak bear, uh, Arctic grizz, whatever, caribou, talk to guys who you think their style would be similar to your style. Um, most guys are willing to share. They want to help. Um, some guys are a little more private that way. That's fine. Um, I would encourage guys to reach out to those that have done it to grill them with questions. Another good question to ask, not just about gear. And, and a lot of guys ask the gear questions, but what about, what did you do to prepare physically? Um, I changed my entire workout routine based on these types of sheep hunting. I'm still doing, you know, I've already started this year to do it, but I implemented a new program last year and that's going into my hunt. I went on a doll sheep hunt last year and that'll be another fun one to talk about, but I completely changed how I work out to prepare for these hunts and the kind of time frame leading up to the hunt so that when I went into that hunt last year in the Yukon and it came into play, Brian, the physical training that I did, it came into play in that hunt. And that's one of the reasons I think we killed the Ram that I killed, but it was, I would love to share that with guys, you know, to tell them what I did, what I felt like was very useful. What I felt like is, is something that is unnecessary but even questions like that, what did you, how did you prepare is something a lot of guys would be willing to share and more than happy to share as well. Man, there's like, um, the game we play is so multifaceted. Like it's such a, you need so many different skill sets to be able to expect success, but especially on a sheep hunt, that physical conditioning, and I'm sure that sharpens your mind as well. And yep. in a lot of fun of these hunts is the anticipation the preparation, like all this stuff you're doing to get ready, imagining what your dream hunt could be like. So like just the cliff notes, uh, Kip, like, like what, how have you changed your training from that, from mule deer? Like, it seems like, a it's a really extreme hunt that requires absolutely everything out of you physically. And, and so what have you kind of changed around or what's been working in these big yeah. mountains for you? 
You know, the thing that I did last year, two years ago, that really changed for me was about three months prior. I'm always out hiking and scouting for the mule deer stuff. And when I started training for sheep hunting, it was it was getting to the I started out backpacking every day. And I started out, I think last year in May, uh, started out with a 50 pound pack. And I started out going three days a week, trying to go for two hours and then slowly increasing to 60 pounds, then 70 pounds, then 80 pounds. And for me, I'm fairly light. I'm about, a, you know, I'm 150, 560 pounds, but I got to the point where I wanted to carry about half my body weight. And then it was getting to the point where I could do that every day back to back to back. Cause you know, in the past I have a Saturday, take a day off, but it was every day back to back to back. And that's a completely different training set. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, just the climbing. It is so interesting to have that kind of weight on your back and be going downhill as well. Most guys think about doing stair climbers or climbing up, but it's the muscles in the way that a heavy pack rides on your back, on your frame when you're going down is almost just as important as going up. And that's something I think that I often overlooked. And when I started training that way, I realized I was building certain muscles that were great for going uphill and I needed to develop certain muscles to help stabilize myself going downhill. And you get more weight on your knees. And so I think that component, that's the Cliff Notes version, is give yourself a two to three month window. Start, pat, and you have to train with weight on your back. You, there's nothing else that can get you prepared than just getting a weight on, getting weight on your back to the point where you can get significant weight on your back, go up and down, and go back to back to back to back dates. And then it's all about staying hydrated and eating enough food. Um, I got to the point by the time the hunt rolled around last year, before I went up to the Yukon, I'd lost, I was down to like 158 pounds, which for me, you want to be a little heavy going into the hunt, but I had found that sweet spot. I had found where I had developed strength. I've shed a few pounds that were probably unnecessary, but my body had adjusted to hiking up and down back to back days, five, six days in a row, carrying weight. And there's just no other way to try to train for a hunt like that than to get weight on your back and to hike like that. So in a nutshell, that's what I would say is the Cliff Notes version is being able to do it four or five, six days in a row to where when you go on a hunt like that, you, you know, you're going to have to do multiple days back to back. And just if nothing else to feel like you've done it before and if you have to do it again, you will. But that's the mental component of, you know, the, the training, physical training component we just talked about. Then there's the mental component. You know, last year, uh, just really quick, on the opening day of my sheep hunt in the Yukon, we were trying to relocate a sheep we had found the day before the hunt. And by the time we finally found him, he was like two miles away. And we had to make a decision to go or not. And it was literally, you know, my my guide, Eric Labrie, and my the other guy with us, Otto, who's awesome. These two guys were so great, Brian. But we're sitting there, we see this ram that we think is the same ram we had found the day before the hunt, but he's two miles away, and we're gassed. We've ridden horses in 30 miles. We'd already scouted the day before, hiked up and down. Here it is, day one. We find the ram, midday, clear across, and I just said, Eric, let's go. Like, let's go. I feel good. And we literally ran. Like, we were running. And, and Eric and I laughed about it, but we were sprinting, trying to get in position, and it turns out, it's a good thing we did because we killed that ram. But if we hadn't have been in, in the, had the ability to go and go that fast, we wouldn't have killed that ram. He was on the move and we intercepted him at the last minute and killed him. But uh, it was the mental um, realization that I could do it. Let's go. And so that's a big part of it as well as feeling like physically and mentally, you know where your boundaries are and you know when to push them and you know when you need to pull back a little bit and maybe save it for another day. Man. Um, that's so so awesome to like hear about the 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 training and then I know what you're saying like when you have that mental edge you can just you you, you have less excuses you don't say no you know what you're capable of and I I just love like your training with weight because that that weight is such the equalizer you know the weight on your back up and down which is important and that's kind of what I've blown up like here bear hunting recently is is my quads because I'm doing a lot of bike work <laughs> and I'm going downhill sprinting to try to get on these bears and it's not a real heavy pack but even the day pack with camera gear and stuff is 25 30 pounds that's yeah. actually what I've been making sore is my quads and then like you say there's nothing like like trying to go on fatigued legs and so 
when I'm going day after day after day, it's like by day three or day four, day five of going really hard or these big sends or this all this bike work, like then being able to go on fatigued legs, it, it really trains you and then sharpens your mind. And there's just nothing like a like a strong mind in the mountains. You just you, you, you don't say no. There's no hole too deep. There's no animal too far. It's like you just trust in your body and trust that you can get that animal out there. So yeah. like how amazing to hear about your training and then to hear how it came into play God, you got to feel great physically too on those hunts just that you like like the experience of you being able to go back like to already have sheep hunts under your belt and pack that weight and done it day after day and been so tired and so fatigued now you get to take that into your training and 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 really be intentional with your training to do that that weight on your back up and down and heavy weight too like we weigh about the same and yeah that you know 80 yeah. pounds sounds crazy to me like that's a lot of weight to be packing up and down the mountains but it sounds like that's what's necessary to try to expect success on something like that. And then definitely came into play like running after that, that doll last year in the Yukon. Yeah. It's just amazing yeah. to hear about. Kim. Yeah, it was fun. It was great, but it, it, it feels good to feel prepared. And the other, the other realistic component of it is to, is to know when you need to let your body rest a little bit. So that, that comes into play with that same training where, you know, maybe maybe you've hit it hard for a day or two or three, and you realize I need some recovery. I need a day to recover. But that's why I think it's important for if you have hunts coming up in the fall, to you know, don't wait. Give yourself a good two three month cushion to get ready for some of these hunts like that. If they're these epic, well, you know, hunt of a lifetime opportunities, it would sure be a shame to feel like you're going into that hunt not feeling physically prepared. And then there's the other component of it which is the gear stuff stuff that you find useful stuff that you don't need as much um I, you know there was a, just a couple of these small things i learned on some of these hunts where i'm like i really need that and i really don't need that but then it's just part of that preparation process of it um but the, you know you know one of the funny parts about this is i realized going to alaska when you're hunting caribou or these grizzlies how important a glassing tarp is and i i have never used a glassing tarp ever I never use them for mule deer hunting. You just crawl under a tree if it's raining or, you know, you put your, you put your rain gear on and you hunt. And I remember um, my outfitter up there, the first year I went up to hunt doll sheep said, you don't want to hunt in the rain. And I said, what do you mean by that? Like we're in Alaska, you have to hunt in the rain. He's like, well, it's, it's really, if you get wet and you get cold, he just said, I'm being honest, you're done. You will be done. It's very few times that, that you get clients or hunters up there whose gear, meaning under your rain gear, get wet, your sleeping bag gets wet, your shoes get soaked on the inside, your socks are wet. He's like, you're, you'll be surprised how that can ruin a hunt. So his, his caution was to be very careful about hunting in the rain in a way that puts you at risk. And I went up, the second year I went up with him and I had a glassing tarp and I, I had thought about how to hunt in the rain when you're hunting for grizz or you're hunting for caribou. Uh, and I realized if you can glass all day, even if you can't move and you can glass all day, those animals move all day. So I made sure that year to bring a glassing tarp. I did it again this year. And that's how I've killed both of my grizzlies is being able when the weather sucks to not, you know, just be holed up in your tent waiting for the weather to clear or you could lose half your hunt right there. So in both scenarios, I set up my glassing tarp. I was wearing rain gear. I had a little stove next to me a little MSR reactor that has a really broad stove face. So if you're not using it to cook your food, you can at least, if nothing else, at, at very strategic times, just warm your hands up, get your feet over there, warm your feet up. And then you're hunting. You're literally hunting all day. And that, in in these situations where I've been able to take these Arctic grizz, it's been, you know, the weather's been crappy, but I've been able to sit under that tarp and just glass and pick stuff up moving and little things like that. I've had some guys ask me about gear and, um, friends of mine that have reached out to do some of these hunts and I'm like you know you and I hunt the same it's pretty much your gear list is going to be my list but here's a couple little things that I didn't know that have been key for my success and that's again where the reaching out part of it and the sharing come into play there's a lot of guys on social media now that really know what they're doing and you can kind of get a feel for who spends a lot of time in the hills and those guys there's a lot of good information out there but like those are two little tips Brian like the glassing tarp was huge 
and that little MSR reactor stove where I could warm my hands up when it was cold. Those are these little psychological advantages you get in the field sometimes that perhaps maybe you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Yeah, oh, man. Uh, yeah, it's uh, you're so right. And these different habitats, these different weather conditions, it, it's like different than what we're used to. Even though we have a ton of experience hunting out west, it's like you go to one of these places like I did a, a BC goat hunt last year. And so, you know, I didn't ask too many questions. I'm like, oh, my backcountry gear is pretty dialed. You know, I know what to bring. And so I get up there and I, I connect with my buddy up there and then we go up and, you know, I should have asked more questions. I ended up bringing like a, a bivy tent and we ended up like camping above tree line and it's in BC where you get a bunch of weather and rain and wind. Yep. Like it wasn't the right, like I made it work and it was fine and it didn't ruin the hunt or anything, but it would have been better if I would have brought a better shelter that was more taunt, more like a three season or a four season with tie downs. So it didn't yep. flap in the wind at night. So I could have got better sleep, better to ride out storms. Like there's just some of this gear that's going to work better in different places or that you could make better choices just by asking questions and, and getting input. And I love the glassing tarp, man. It's like, um, that is on my list to have this year. Uh, you know, that glassing tarp, you know, you can also use it like instead of bringing rain pants and if yep. in a big storm, you can wrap up in that tarp and keep dry, you know, if it's going to clear off and then being able to set it up with your trekking poles or with sticks, yep. get it staked down and then to be able to spend the day underneath it like you did. And it sounds like that's been a huge key to your success. Uh, do you have one that you recommend, Kip? I'm trying to remember the one that I have. I just sent it to a friend of mine. Um, I'll think of it as we're talking. Um, oh, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I'll, I'll have to look. I'll, yeah, just send it to me. I'll mention it in the intro there so guys have it. But, um, yeah, that's on my list to get this year. I think that's absolutely clutch in storms like that. And, and two, it's like you're not – held up in your tent like you mentioned like you you're, you're able to sit underneath that tarp and keep fairly dry and comfortable and able to continue to hunt and continue to glass um, yeah it's amazing how important that glass I, I just looked it up it's the seek outside dst tarp is the one that i have been using yeah oh, cool. the seek outside brand and you can set it up in multiple yeah so that again it's kind of funny brian that's one little thing i never take a tarp on my you know high country backcountry mule deer hunts uh and that is one thing i'll never go without up there and you know you'll find guides and stuff that maybe don't need it but for me you know i love if it, you know we have a window that we can do some of those hunts on where you're up there for 10 days or maybe two weeks but it's something you look forward to all year or all you know your lifetime and to lose the opportunity to miss half your hunt because of the weather because of the rain those animals move in the rain so that you know, that was one, again, just one little thing. But there are so many little nuggets and, and pearls like that that you can get from different guys if you're willing to reach out and ask. Uh, and like I said, most guys are willing to share uh, information like that. So that's been that whole Alaska doll sheep, grizzly going up there. Uh, you know, we were up in the Brooks Range and then I was hunting doll sheep in Alberta last year or in the Yukon. And it's completely different topography. But what was new to me is hunting off horses. I've never done much horse hunting. I'm always backpacking. Horses still scare me. I just have a hard time trusting an animal that big. And so the first year I went stone sheep hunting, we, we took horses in 30 miles and I was on a smaller horse that, that had a, a gate where I almost had to stand in the saddle the whole time. And by the time we got to camp, it was in the middle of the night. We'd been horse on the horses for I, almost 30 miles. My knees were so dang sore because I was holding them myself up in the stirrups almost the whole time. <laughs> and so when I went on this hunt last year, a different hunt, you know, last year, the following year, that was the first thing I said to the outfitters, you've got to put me on a horse with a larger gate because if I have to stand up the whole time. And so they did, they were like, yeah, I would never would have known that though. I never would have known had I not gone on a hunt. I'm thinking about the physical preparation and the hiking and everything. And then I get on a horse that had this really short, small, short gate and I was having to stand up. And it, it, I'm telling you, my knees were swollen. And the funny thing is, so my knees were so sore, but we went out and hunted the next day. And my guide and I got onto this ram right off the bat. We ended up bailing off a cliff and I fell and shattered my kneecap. Um, but my knees, it was funny. My knees were so numb. I didn't notice it. I fell, ended up getting back up, chased after this ram, shot him before I went off into this cliff area and we got him. 
and it was and then the next day we so we're back in camp the next day and my knees were still so sore from riding the horses in and I didn't realize how bad that kneecap was and I didn't want to say anything because I kind of felt stupid um but I realized after the hunt that kneecap was totally shattered and I just didn't notice it because my knees were so inflamed from horse packing in so that that took some time to recover from that but kind of a funny story <laughs> oh my gosh Kev, that <laughs> yeah. is brutal it shattered your kneecap like on the hitting it on the rocks i always think about that and that gnarly terrain and those cliffs that that uh the the rocks and those it's like such unforgiving terrain i would think like uh you know an accident could happen pretty quick something like that Oh yeah, the guide. I took off running after this ram, and uh, Floyd, my guide behind me, was yelling at me to stop. Like, I, and I'm sure he's probably seen a rodeo like like that before that doesn't end well. And he was like telling me to stop, but I could. I had a vantage point on the ram that Floyd didn't have, and I could tell that once the ram cleared this outcropping, he'd be out of sight. So I had about a oh I don't know a 250 yard sprint across this pretty rocky face, but I ended up taking one fall and just you know, slammed my knee on a real jagged rock. Um, but it's funny in those adrenaline moments like that, I just kept going. I knew it was bad, but I just kept going. The ram actually ended up stopping right on this cliff ledge. And I threw my pack down and pulled up and ended up harvesting him. But I, yeah, I just didn't realize. And, and and that's one of those looking back. It's like, well, I was able to harvest the stone sheep and I'm glad, but uh, you know, as gu- I'm sure guides see stuff like that and think, oh no, here we go. The circus has begun <laughs> and it could have, you know, it could have ended poorly for me and I was fortunate it didn't, it didn't keep me from being able to continue to hunt. But yeah, um, you know, that terrain up there is so rugged and so extreme, but that opened my world up again to some of these sheep hunts where when you have horses, you can hunt in a completely different way then you know if you're hunting out of your backpack and you can see the value in that type of country when you gotta when you're not hunting till you're 25 30 miles in and you're packing in you know that's a four or five day pack trip in and then you're already gassed and so seeing how some of these outfitters you know can haul you into the hunt area with horses even if you're not a horse person like i'm not you can see this completely changes the way you you hunt this country is when you're able to haul gear and like that with horses so yeah that's wild. Yeah, I would never think of my knees in the gait of that horse and making them that sore that they were still numb and still so sore days later and something that you can't really train for. So no. the, the gait, you just had to stand up on those stirrups and then your legs were kind of bent around the, the horse. So it put your knees in an awkward angle to carry that much weight or to, lo- to ride that long, huh? Yeah, the the horses that they were on just had larger strides and the horse guys listening to this are going to be rolling their eyes because i'm so inexperienced i don't know what i'm talking well, about me but... too i'm right with you so that's yeah, why I'm I, asking. But I, I, I admit my own ignorance here but they were on horses with larger gates so you know they're riding in the saddles on an easy gate and my horse just had smaller steps and so for every two strides their horse took mine was taking three or four and almost so it was almost at a gallop the whole time it would kept running to catch up and running to catch up and running to catch up and even when it was caught up it was kind of trotting and I was having to hold myself up in the saddle with my arms and it just you know four five six seven eight hours of that by the time we got I my knees were so sore um I just, I kind of laugh at it now, but that was the first thing I said last year when we were going to pack in off on that doll sheep hunt. I told the outfit, I said, do not put me on a horse. That's the only, and it was funny because, you know, you talk, you talk about things that can go wrong on these hunts, you know, things will go wrong. You know, you plan these hunts, you can plan and prep and do everything you, you can do to be ready for them. And then stuff will happen. And so when I went on my uh, doll sheep hunt last year up in the Yukon, they lost my luggage. And so this is just another pearl to share with guys is I made sure in my carry-on that I had I had my binoculars and my spotting scope I had the bare essentials that you can legally bring in your carry-on I had with me in the event that they might lose part of your luggage well they did you know my gun showed up and I had what was in my carry-on but my suitcase they lost and I had all my clothes had all my hunting gear that I legally couldn't bring on a carry-on and I didn't have it so I'm up there getting ready to go into hunt doll sheep and the outfitter is like, well, what have you got? And I was like, I've got my gun and I've got my, my backpack and the boot. And so I, I, luckily I wore my hunting boots in case, you know, that happened. I had my boots on, had my optics 
and you know he's kind of like well what do you want to do kip and i was like you know I'm, I'm here to hunt so if you can give me a pocket knife and a tripod i think i think we're good to go and so he got me those things and we ended up having a great hunt but you have to kind of little things like that just knowing to carry some of that gear that you absolutely in the worst case scenario wouldn't want to be without if you can bring it on your carry-on on the plane have it with you on the plane uh and then they ended up flying in my my suitcase showed up my bag showed up halfway through the hunt so they ended up flying it into me but by then the hunting was over we were done and so we kind of just took the rest of the hunt we rode horses we fished we enjoyed it um but here was this moment in this hunt where the outfitter's like what do you want to do do you want to wait around and see if your luggage shows up <laughs> and i'm like no i'm here to hunt and it may never show up so let's go and it ended up being just a, a fantastic hunt one of those hunts i'll never forget but here's a scenario uh where you're like oh i you know what do you do what do you do in a situation like that and you just try to make the best of it and it'll happen it'll happen to the best of us i'm sure man that's um it's crazy yeah it's like uh yeah you put it really well when you said there's there's going to be hurdles and challenges you're just not sure what they're going to be and you can prepare and prep and try to mitigate as many of those as you can but there's going to be things that come up on every hunt and there there is even you know, in the States or traveling around and you're not sure what can go wrong. But the good thing is, is you were prepared wearing in your hunting boots, having your, your glass with you and your carry on. And, and yeah, he asked you the question, do you want to wait around or not? And it's like, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go for it. You know, give me a few items and some, some clothing and heck let's go for it. So yeah, that's a great tip as well. And then how, how about the shooting? Like, um, man, you're, you're putting so much emphasis and prep and you're so excited for these hunts, but man, you got to be good with your weapon in there and, and good with your gun. And, and it, yeah. it isn't a given to make a good shot with a rifle and especially some of these tough mountain shots that you're making. And, and all of these successful hunts come down to making a shot. So that's not a given either. Like how much time are you spending with your weapon and shooting positions and just making sure you're, you're like confident and comfortable and then also does just being a hunter for so many years like you have like being able to control that moment and execute good shots does that come into play as well yeah it really does 99 percent of it's knowing your gun in that situation and same with bow hunting knowing your bow but just knowing where your range is um and uh so that that's probably the most important part of that component of it is knowing your gun. And then a lot of these, a lot of these outfitters and guides, they don't want you, you know, on a sheep hunt, throwing lead across the Canyon when it's just too far. And so, you know, I, I'm trying to think the first sheep I killed in Alaska, it, that actually was a long shot. It was almost 600 yards, but the sheep was broadside and I had done a lot of long range shooting. The conditions were perfect. There wasn't any wind. And so that one was a long shot, but the guide for us was like, are you sure you're comfortable with this? Are you comfortable? And it, so much of it was, nope, I feel comfortable. I know what I've done with this gun. So knowing your gun, knowing the ballistics, trusting the gun, and then, but most of the time the guides would like to see you get closer. The, the sheep I killed last year in the Yukon was, I think, 250, um, which is, it should be a, a dead ram. Um the stone sheep was about that, but that is 99% of it is knowing where your gun is hitting, you know, and, and uh, sometimes one of the components that's lost on guys is, is knowing the elevation you're hunting in. These guns will shoot different at different elevations. And so having a chart that's accurate for the elevation you're hunting at, that's one of the first questions I'll ask these outfitters is what's the elevation we're hunting at. It's going to be different in BC than it is in the Yukon than it is in Alaska. And so, making sure that your ballistic charts are up to date and current with the elevations you're hunting at. Um, and then talking to your guide is in, in all of these scenarios where I've killed caribou or, or sheep hunting with the rifle, it's talking with them and making sure. And, you know, that's one other thing I would suggest too, Brian is having conversations with your guides prior to going out with them in the field. I would recommend that even you know, when you arrive in camp and you're getting ready to hike out, the first, you know, when I went on my first guided hunt with Cole, going back to Cole Kramer and Kodiak, Cole just said, Kip, tell me, you know, what are you looking for out of this hunt? Let's talk about this ahead of time. What kind of bear are you looking for? And so we had very clear expectations on what I was hoping to get. And then Cole also laid his expectations out for me. He said, I just, you know, and this is the Cliff Notes version again, but he was like, look, I'm the guide. 
So in these situations, my number one priority is your safety. Number two is, is, you know, I'm the expert in this area and you really need to leave that decisions up to me when it comes to certain things, but to have that conversation up front to make sure. So when stuff is happening as so often does in hunting, when all of a sudden you're zero to 60 and you know, it's, it's a slow hunt, it's a slow hunt. And then all of a sudden you got everything happening at once. Some of these decisions have already been made. And so, you know, I'll, I'll talk to the guides about how far I'm comfortable shooting they should talk about, you know, what kind of shot they'd like you to get. But having these conversations up front, you know, it's not a bad idea to go in and have questions already prepared that you want to talk with your guide about. Because um, so much of these hunts, it comes down to communicating with your guide and communicating with the person that you're hunting with so that when situations happen, you're prepared. That has come into play in almost every one of these instances. So that's something I would very strongly recommend if you're going on one of these types of hunts is if you don't know who your guide's going to be. And a lot of times you don't, a lot of times, you know, you're showing up in the base camp and stuff is always happening in the field where one guide is moving in and out and another guide's moving in and out and you got different clients coming in and out. But in the, in the moment where you're matched up with who your guide will be at some point before you're out hunting to have that talk about, um, I, again, I, I think back at the, the hunt I did last year in the Yukon with Eric Labrie, who was my guide, that was the first thing Eric and I did when I got flown into this base camp and we were getting ready to horse pack in. Eric just said, let's talk about what you want out of this hunt. And it was kind of fun, Brian. I said, look, Eric, um, I'm just looking at this like you're you're one of my hunting buddies and we're going to do this together. And that is the way we approach that hunt. So whenever we were going after sheep or looking at a sheep, that's like I said, when, when we finally saw the ram I went after and we did this full on sprint, we spotted this ram two miles away, clear up on this rocky uh, ridge and I was looking at it through the scope then Eric would look at it and we were talking about what we thought it was and could it be the ram from yesterday and we did this kind of back and forth dialogue and and then it was like Eric I think that's it let's go and so we had another talk about well which route do we take but in, in that scenario we were comfortable enough with one another to approach it kind of as a team a team play and give back and forth dialogue. When I was on Kodiak with Cole, I was like, Cole, I've never seen a Kodiak bear. I've never been in country like this. You know, you're making the call and I'm absolutely deferring to your judgment. And, and I really relied upon Cole that way, but it was, I would always recommend to make sure you have that conversation. Yeah, it makes sense. Like just good communication. And I know traveling to these different places, like they, you know, it, it, um, it, it's almost uh, it, it's tough because we have so much hunting experience in our in our background and you want to work together towards a common goal, like you're saying. But it it some of these guys that I hunt with, like in B.C., my buddy had killed, you know, a bunch of goats with his bow and he's like really good at hunting them, really good at judging them. And so, you know, it's like I, I got to kind of take a back seat here. He's hunted this place before. He knows the country better than I do. And so, you know, I definitely have to defer to him on some of these decisions or at least get his input and have a conversation about it. It's like I don't know best or if I'm in Australia and I'm hunting red deer, it's like, yeah, I've hunted yeah. a lot of elk, but I've never hunted, you know, a free range red deer. And this buddy that I'm hunting with has hunted them for 20 years in this location and knows all the farmers and knows what these red deer do in those situations. And so, you know, their, their knowledge has more weight than my, de than mine in those situations. And we're working towards a common goal or, or hunting sandbar, or hunting, you know, New Zealand tar, like whatever it is, like, uh, you, you also have to put some trust and faith and a lot of weight into what the, the professionals or what the guys that have more experience than I do hunting these animals and hunting this terrain do. And, um, I, th I just think it's good and it it shows true intelligence is like when you can defer to somebody else to like, yeah, I don't know everything about everything and I definitely don't know everything about this terrain and that species. So, you know, I'm going to defer to you. Like, what do you think about it? Like to to work together towards a common goal. But I think you you also have to put some trust in that guide and some faith in that guide and a lot of weight into what he's saying, you know, as, as he does have a ton of experience. Yeah, and those guys, the guides on these types of hunts, they want you to have the best experience you can have. And so you do have the commonality there. You want to have, you know, everybody's goals for a hunt are a little bit different. But in the end, the guides want to keep you safe. They want to help you have the most positive experience you can. And they really do. 
you know, accommodate their hunters. You know, these guys are assessing their hunters as they go and they can tell when somebody is maybe not as experienced, but is ready to learn and they can see when other guys have more experience. And so my experience, although it's been brief in the, just the last few years is these guys, these guides work incredibly hard and they're trying to give you the best experience you can, but ultimately, absolutely. You need to rely on them, especially in, in scenarios that involve, um, safety that involve uh you know it, it just seems to all start to happen when you're going after an animal and that's when you know i am more than happy to say please what are your thoughts you help me out here and it's not a pride thing in any way it's you're the expert i'm here and i know that you have my best interest in mind and i the fun thing is i have i have made some very 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 good friends on these hunts with these guides and outfitters and so not only can you walk away from some of these experiences having a great hunting experience, but you can walk away with some really good friends and not, and sometimes the other clients as well. You have the opportunity to meet other hunters, other clients, and you can develop friendships that way. And it's amazing how many hunts start getting traded that way amongst clients and hunters. And they start to talk after the hunt and they'll kind of start swapping hunts and sharing info. And that's another benefit to doing some of these types of hunts as well. Man, it's the best like some of these friends I've made that can live and grow up in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. We have that commonality and that love for like the outdoors and for the quarry. And you do, you spend 10 days together and you go through these trials and tribulations together and you just make like the best friends. Like uh, some of the, the best friends I have in my life are guys that I I've just met and hunted with for about 10 or 12 days. And now we've done multiple hunts together and, and um, you know, they, they just um, the absolute salt of the earth. And this is like part of the experience. It's like, you're going after these animals or this quarry. And that is the goal that you're working hard towards. But man, it's like the, the friendships you make. Like, I love the local culture, like being able to go to these different places and hang out with a, with the locals and see how they do it or hanging out with their friends and family or being able to have these conversations and then to travel to these different places and, and just to like, like cities and, and towns don't get me fired up or don't make me excited, but to go and to see like, this vast nature, this uh, super extreme terrain and be able to interact with it. And it's just totally different than anything we've ever laid eyes on that we've ever experienced. And, and then I, I especially get fired up to like chase a new species and be able to learn about it, to be able to see it in the glass, to be able to appreciate it, uh, kind of like match wits with it. It's just the absolute best way to experience life, to travel and experience these different places. And it changes you a bit. And so I can see like why you've gotten hooked on it. I can, you know, it's the exact same reason why I've gotten hooked on it. It's just like, um, it, it's something to really look forward to and, and some of my fondest memories. And so like, like you've motivated me as well, like, uh, seeing some of your, your photos and videos and, and some of the critters you've taken and then hearing you talk about it. And so like, I know I've got a trip coming up to Hawaii, which is one of my favorites, which I've got really good friends out there. And so we're going to go hunt mouflon sheep in the Lava Rock Canyon, some axis deer, you know, talking about that Alaskan Yukon moose hunt next year. And then, wow. you know, starting to make some plans for like, uh, uh, the Asiatic water Buffalo there in Austra Australia and the Northern territories, which is just gnarly heat and saltwater crocs and mambas. And like, <laughs> you know, it's just a totally different world. And, um, you know, I'm just really fortunate that I have this opportunity, but it is about, you know, it's like, uh, uh, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna run out of time before we run out of money. And I, I yeah, may not be a wealthy yeah. guy, but I'm just gonna figure it out and, and have these experiences. And so like, like what's next for you, Kip, like you're hooked on these big adventures and traveling. Like, what do you have in the works? Yeah. You know, I'm looking at a bighorn sheep hunt in Alberta this fall that I'd like to get worked out. Um, and, but then at some point you, you can only tap the bank account so much and you're like, okay, I'm being really irresponsible right now. And so I've hit this little, but my realization, Brian was realizing, I don't want to be 75 years old and have all the money in my bank and I can't hunt anymore. And I should have done these hunts when I was younger. So there's this, there's this sweet spot where you realize you want to do some of these types of hunts while you can but you have to be financially responsible as well. And, and I'm, I think I'm still tr <laughs> trying to find that balance, but I definitely don't want to be looking back. And I think you and I have talked about that, but I don't want to be looking back at all my financial 
uh, success and having wished I would have taken some of the opportunity to do some of these hunts I've always wanted to do as hunters. Um, we're wired this way. We think about it all the time, you know, and and amidst balancing work and family and everything else, we all have these hunts that are these bucket list hunts we want to do. And I just encourage guys to find a way to do them and do them while you're young and do them while you can and keep in mind the big perspective of balance. Um, but in the end, what I've been able to do over the last kind of three, four, five years with some of these hunts, I'm so glad I did them. I am so glad I'm able to look back and see that I was able to go to Kodiak and I was able to go to Alaska and I was able to go to Alberta and the Yukon. And those are the things that fuel me to want to keep going. And that's, I think that's what, for a lot of guys that enjoy this type of hunting, you know, not everybody does this type of hunting, but for those that do, it affects everything you do. It affects the decisions you make for work. It affects how you eat. It affects how you train. And those are all very positive things. If you're training with a backpack loaded with 60 pounds in the mountains five days a week to get in shape for a sheep hunt, well, that's doing more than just affecting your ability to sheep hunt. It's what you're eating. So there's so many good aspects of this lifestyle as long as you keep it balanced. And I, that's, so right now I'm looking and I'm trying to work out a, a you know, a sheep hunt, a bighorn sheep hunt in Alberta. And I'm already starting to train for that and think about that if things can happen. But there are also positive aspects, even if it didn't work out and I wasn't able to go, it's it's the preparing for it, the planning for it, the hoping for it, the thinking about it that I think brings so much positivity into our lives. Um, and I got a big dose of that uh, just on all of these hunts, that there are so many positive aspects to it. And so even if you can't afford to do a hunt like this, but you know you can go buy an over-the-counter tag in Idaho for bear. You can go buy an over-the-counter, you know, tag in in certain states. You can still use these same methods of preparing. And if it's a low-dollar, you know, blue-collar over-the-counter hunt, you can still have the same type of experience. And that's all I did growing up. That's all I did until I was in my, you know, early 40s was doing those types of hunts. And I can't say that they were less meaningful. You know, my my memories growing up and yours. And probably most guys are just hunting with a good friend or a family member on a cheap hunt. And they're as meaningful as any of these other types of hunts. And so it's it's a lifestyle for us. And uh, it's something that I'm just grateful for. I'm grateful that I was raised the way that I was raised, where my dad and brother and I and our uncle and cousins, we were out enjoying wildlife and enjoying the mountains and nature and it's sacred. It's something that's very, it's, it's a sacred thing for me. And as I get older, I turn 50 in a couple of weeks. I can't believe it, Brian, I'm going to be 50, but this is such a big part of who I am and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful that, um, I have this love of this incredible, uh, earth that we live on and I'm healthy enough right now to keep doing it. <laughs> I think I'm going to do this as long as I live. I don't, I don't know if I'm 80 and, and can't do it anymore. I think I'm, it's going to be tough for me when I'm 80. It's going to be hard, but I'm sure enjoying the ride right now. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. You're going to do it for um, a, a bunch of years moving forward. And yeah, you just keep yourself in great shape. And it, you're right. It just drives us to be good people. And it also drives us to be better with our family and kids. And, you know, it's, it's just like living a meaningful life. And you're right. You don't have to pay a bunch of money to go have an adventure. Like there's a bunch of opportunities around if you're willing to suss them out and go have an adventure out in the wild, you know? And so, yeah, I think we just need to take those steps and go for it. And you're definitely a prime example of that. So, um, man, it's just like, it's so fun to get you on Kip and to catch up with you. I, I just, uh, I feel so inspired and motivated, like after talking to you and, um, it's, it's just, um, it's so fun hearing about a bunch of your adventures you've done and, um, adventures in the future. So definitely pulling for you and, and, um, yeah, keep in touch and I'm going to keep following along. Uh, I just love those photos on social media, those different places you've traveled and different experiences. So yeah, just keep up the good work, Kip. And it's really fun to talk to you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, Brian. We'll stay in touch. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Awesome podcast with Kip. Uh, really like catching up to him. So, um, yeah, we recorded uh, a bit ago, as you could probably tell. Uh, I've been sitting on a few recordings here, releasing them uh, during season, just so I could get some stock built up and um, go disappear and go hunt for a while. So, yeah, really appreciate Kip, him being on, and um, wish him all the um, best luck out hunting this year. It's just awesome to hear about some of those great big adventures for, like, 
sheep and for bears and um, what it takes to be successful as well. His training is just off the hook. I've been following his training on his social media. And then um, some of the country he gets to go to is just amazing as well. So I'm a huge fan of doing those big adventures. And um, Kip has been doing a great job at um, going all in on those things and taking advantage of them. So pumped for that guy. And, um, yeah, thanks to you guys for listening into the podcast. Thanks to our sponsors, Savage, Silencer Central, and Camo Fire. Thanks to Eastman's for their support of the podcast. Uh, make sure to go check out my other podcasts, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Life of a Bow Hunter. Some great episodes on there with Dan Bacar. Uh, the last couple weeks or the last couple episodes have been insanely good as we're during season attitude and, um, uh, uh, the the mental fortitude that comes along with it, um, you know, just preparing for season, the chaos of season, some great episodes on there. So it's on a different feed. Go check that out and uh, everything we're doing over there at Eastman. So I uh, really appreciate you guys, the support, the um, reviews on iTunes, and then also the shares on social media. Those help me out. And, um, yeah, I'm getting ahead on some of these podcasts so I can go disappear in the mountains. So as this comes out, I'll either be continuing to hunt mule deer or I think I'll be on to uh, hunting elk and um, chasing those things around. So it's the most exciting time of the year, and I'm so fortunate that I can really focus on my hunting, get ahead on these podcasts, get stuff done at work, which I'm not totally done with, but I got a couple more days and going to knock a bunch of it out today and uh, get some carpentry done on the job site and get ready to uh, rock and roll here. So. I'm pumped. Thanks, you guys, for following along. And um, with that, I'll get you a podcast next week.